Praise the Lord. Let's close our eyes for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us to this session of Bible teaching. Thank you for what you're leading us through in all this leadership series. We're asking, O oh Lord, that you implant your word in our heart again this time in Jesus' name. Make us strong in the inner man, strong in conviction, and to lead like you want us to lead. And as we're coming to the conclusion of this Congress, we pray, O oh Lord, everything you've done from the beginning, you reconfirm in every heart in Jesus' name. Bless your people. Keep us awake tonight as we hear the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And everybody said, Amen. God bless every one of you. You can please be seated. In our leadership series, we come to another message. Already you understand and you know that I've been taking the letters of the word leadership. And through those letters of the word leadership, we'll be introducing you to important aspects of leadership. We have dealt with L, love, in Christ-like leadership. If there's any church that is going to do the work as Christ did it, we must have the life of Christ, the method of Christ, the approach of Christ, the compassion of Christ, and the prayerfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ to bring everything to a conclusion, we must have love like Jesus had. Love for his own. Of course you understand the kind of love Jesus had. Since he gave his own blood and shared his own blood for the sheep. If he paid such a great price, he must really love the sheep. And the Lord is calling us that we manifest the same love. As we think about leadership in the New Testament sense and the Christian sense, then the effectiveness of competent leaders. And you understand all that goes into competence, all that goes into development, all that goes into raising up yourself in the Lord so that you'll be the kind of leader you ought to be and then you become effective if anointing. The anointing that breaks every yoke anointing of consecrated leaders and already we have learned for you to be anointed that way and to break the yoke you'll be a serious minded believer a sober believer a steadfast believer a separated believer and a believer that is willing to sacrifice everything lay everything on the line and it's when you are that consecrated the lord will see fit to pour his anointing upon your life then a discipline d for discipline the discipline of crucified leaders and any exploits of charismatic leaders are uh, for resourcefulness, the resourcefulness of creative leaders. And any signs, supernatural signs, soul saving signs, spectacular signs, signs given by the Spirit of God, by the Holy Ghost, signs for, commi for commissioned leaders. And then holiness in Christian leaders. Without this age, without the holiness, Every other thing will fall apart. And our ministry will not be acceptable in the sight of the Lord. And I hope the leaders here, I hope you are learning. Because if we are leaders and the Lord is raising us up to do the work, we ought to learn. And by the grace of God, I have learned. And sometimes, you know, it's wonderful how you learn. I learn from what is done and what is not done. I learn from what the people write, and I learn from what the people don't even write. I learn in the spaces in between the lines. And I thank the Lord because He has illuminated me and has enlightened me and has inspired me and influences me in such a way. And I check up. And sometimes uh, some of the ministers have not met. I sometimes when I read their books, and some of them were still alive. And I read and read and read, and then in between the lines, there are some things that are not said, but I can, I can get. Not guessing, I just know that in between these lines, in between these paragraphs, there is something that is not said. And then the Lord gives it to me. And when I have opportunity of traveling, I, I go, and then when I go to some of those places, maybe we'll meet in a conference. And that person seems, you know, it's also a speaker there. And then I get near. I said, I, I got hold of your book. 
and I read your book and I mentioned the title. And then I say, there's something you didn't say. But I say is that you went through this experience, this experience, this experience, and then he looks at me and he says, how did you know? I said, just tell me. And he said, yes, I went through that. I felt that that wasn't something to print out. I said, I guess so. You know, if you really want to learn, you learn from what is said and what is not said. What is done, what is not done. What is put there and what is omitted. Or in a conference in England, and uh, I wasn't a speaker there. That's the time I was seeking the Lord. And the time I wanted the anointing. And, you know, I had the opportunity to be on that side, in that side of the world. And I knew the conference was going on. And then I attended the conference. And as I attended the conference, there was somebody, he is dead now, uh, a British, uh, you know, real charismatic Pentecostal person. And uh, he was in the process of wanting to prepare a commentary on the whole Bible because he had read many of the commentaries and he wasn't really happy and fulfilled in everything that he saw. And therefore, he, you know, he preached and the message gave a series. And I attended all his series, I think about three of them in three mornings and uh, or at the table eating in the morning after he had finished his series and he was talking and talking i kept quiet and uh, after he um you know finished all the time and sharing with the others i introduced myself and i said um, looks like uh, you read author such and such show so much he said yes that's my favorite author i said i knew that how did you know that? Well, when you were preaching, you described the Amalekites, and then you described the Canaanites and the Hittites, and all the description you gave, I knew that you were influenced by such an author. You see, when you come to a conference, and when you come to a congress like this, you open your eyes, you open your ears, you see, and you hear. That's how you are going to grow. And that means then, as you go back, you look at all these various qualities, and as you see these qualities you, in your own self to start with and in members of your family as we have just learned and then in other workers and other sections in the church then the work will be moving forward each for holiness in christian leadership and then i for intercession by compassionate leaders and p which we're going to deal with by the grace of god tomorrow progress through courageous leadership tonight we come to the message on intercession intercession by compassionate leaders we look at hebrews chapter 5 hebrews chapter 5 reading from verse 1 for every high priest taking among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to god that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin who can have compassion on the ignorant who can have compassion on the ignorant intercession by of compassionate leaders if we're going to intercede if we're going to pray for the people the way we ought to pray we need to know their state and their state will need to concern us here it says your compassion is on the ignorant intercession of compassionate leaders the ignorant one the impenitent two you see the ignorant they're impenitent and the reason they're impenitent is because they're ignorant of the judgment of god the reason they do not repent of their sins is because of their ignorance and instead of being angry with them instead of being forcy about their impenitence and about their you know incorrigibility what you do you understand they're ignorant forgive them lord they don't know what they're doing you are compassionate to intercede for them number three the immoral and the reason they're immoral is because they're ignorant they're ignorant of the consequences of immorality and they do not know what their immorality and a lack of compassion will bring upon them have compassion on them number four the immodest and sometimes you get to a church and if you are a person that has been taught the scriptures and sometimes uh, as some of the people probably some women who know that this is the way to dress and this is the way to live and this is the way to act there are times that you know, a woman will be so forceful 
And while the husband is on the pulpit wanting to preach, the woman is standing at the gate. And all the young ladies that are coming in, the teenagers that are coming into the church, and they're not dressed very well, the wife will say, where do you think you are coming? From where are you coming? You are coming to deeper life. This is our church. And you want to turn this church to another thing? Go back home. Ah, we don't do it that way. Compassion. Compassion on the ignorant. They are immodest because they are ignorant. And when you see that kind of immodesty, immodest dressing, you know that these people are ignorant. They don't know. They are learned from their right. And they do not know what they ought to know. Compassion, intercession. You begin to intercede for them. Don't destroy the ministry of your husband by becoming so forceful and militant that you are sending the teenagers back home. One, ignorant. Two, impenitent. Three, immoral. Four, immodest. Five, impure. There are people that have impurity. And their lifestyle shows that impurity. They impure. And again, you are having compassion on them. Because there are many impure, they don't understand. Blessed are the pure in heart. Only they shall see the Lord. And it is as you know. That it is ignorance. That will make a person to live. And to be in a church like this. And is holding on to impure heart. And yet to get to heaven. He has read it. He has heard it. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? They that have clean hands. And a pure heart. And they have heard it over and over. They had it at a retreat. Or at a congress. Or in every meeting. And yet they remain impure. It's because they are ignorant. They do not understand what they are playing with. They are playing with fire. But instead of you being boisterous and aggressive. And smashing them down. You are, com you are compassionate towards them. And that's what leads you. It is because you know these people are ignorant of what is for their spiritual profit and benefit. That's what leads you to intercession. Then the indifferent. And it doesn't matter how many kinds of leaders may come and preach. They're indifferent. It doesn't touch them. It doesn't catch them. It doesn't influence them. It doesn't affect them. They are indifferent. Indifferent to the message of life. Indifferent to the thing that will prepare them for heaven. And it is again because they are ignorant. It comes from that word ignorance. Because they are ignorant of what is essential in serving the Lord. That's why they are indifferent. Number seven, the incorrigible. You try to, in our days when we are very, very young... And we say this in our family a lot. Ask my wife about her background. She asks me about my background. And I said, you know what? In our family when I was very young, if uh, some visitors came to the house and uh, my father or my mother didn't want me to stay around, they wouldn't talk. They just look at me and I, I, I understand their look. I understand the appearance once my you know father just looks that direction and he looks a particular way i get the message and then without uh, saying any other thing i'll find a way to I, I'm, I'm away from that place i know daddy doesn't want to stay around or playing any prank at this time i could tell the way he would look and if it's my mother if it's in fact um, you know sometimes i even as uh, some of you i know some of you even uh, know the way i look sometimes and i got that from my mother she's gone on to glory now uh, and my mother uh, i know she would she, she has different different ways of making her you know high balls turn this way turn that way even you know looking at something together and i didn't know i just got that from him and if my mother looks a particular way i know that there's a message she's sending to me and if my father, you know, I was playing and he wanted me to get up from there and go and start reading my book without talking, the posture of my father, the posture, once I see the posture, I get the message. But you see the people of these days and the young people of nowadays, they don't understand even when you say it verbally or you say it with action or you say it with a look or you say it with body language, they never get it. And you'll keep on doing the same thing that you have corrected over and over. Incorrigible. But again, it's because they're ignorant. 
and you as a pastor as a leader instead of jumping up and making announcement and condemning this and condemning that compassion will lead you to intercession and then there are people number eight they are inconsistent and again the reason they're inconsistent is that they're ignorant and the bible says you'll have compassion on the ignorant and their, their ignorance will produce another kind of characteristic or character in them inconsistency today they are good and you want to praise them it's like they almost become an angel overnight and then the other time they almost become the opposite of an angel they are inconsistent and again instead of saying i am disappointed you people are not doing well and this is not going on this church you are inconsistent how long are we going to say this you were doing well last week why are you not doing better this week don't shout don't grumble don't complain compassion on the ignorance go on your knees and pray intercession of compassionate leaders number nine the infirm infirm that means those who have infirmity they're sick and they're ignorant of the promises of god they cannot hold the promise by themselves and because they're ignorant of the stripes of jesus healed by the stripes of jesus delivered by what jesus christ has done they are ignorant of the fact that we are redeemed from the curse of the law that infirmity is staying on them and instead of saying i've been preaching all this time in the faith clinic and we have been preaching on faith all this time and you have been in the church for all these uh, many years and you don't understand why is it you don't understand instead of complaining about the infirmity again you are compassionate on the ignorant if they knew the promises of God, if they knew about their redemption, if they knew about their healing, they'll not be as informed like that. They'll not keep the infirmity, but it's no time to quarrel with them. And it's no time to be, you know, to drive them away. Compassion will lead you to intercession for them. The incurable, number 10. The incurable. And the reason they think they're incurable again is because they, they're ignorant of the promises of the Lord. Because the Lord will even raise the dead. And what can you think about the incurable when somebody is dead? That's like incurable, incurable. And you know, many, many things are happening. You, we may not, you, you may not understand. And you, the simple prayers that are given out. Uh, one of the brothers, one of the overseers uh, in, our, in our country here, uh, wrote uh, the testimony, uh, some of the testimonies of what happened in this last retreat. And in this last retreat, he said, uh, they, during the faith clinic, in one of the sessions, a, a child of seven years of age had died and this child that died the prayer warriors there they said no we're not going to allow this this child is not going to go like this we're going to and they prayed and prayed and prayed and they prayed for i don't know how many hours and it was in in the very very early in the morning the child just gave up and the child died and while they prayed and prayed and prayed and nothing happened then the early morning phase clinic started and as the faith clinic started, he said, all right, let's say, listen to the message. And, you know, the child was there dead. And when the brother wrote that, I, when, he, when I saw him, he came to this congress. Of course, being a state overseer, he has to come. And then I, I checked off. I said, the, the testimony you wrote, I, I need explanation about that. And then he gave me explanation. He said, this, 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 this. They, what happened is that as we gave the message out in the faith clinic, and then the child was still lying there lifeless and the prayer warriors had done their best and nothing could happen and then the prayer came forth after that uh, after the faith clinic the power of god came on that child and that child got up i thought you'll clap your hand is that how you can clap praise the lord and so even if there are incurable people incurable how can you go how far can you go in being incurable by the time somebody is dead, that looks incurable. But you see, the, way, the reason people think that something is incurable, this cannot be done, that cannot be done. The reason is because they are ignorant. Ignorant of the commission that the Lord has given to the people of God. Go, heal the sick, cast out devils, raise the dead. Freely you have received and freely give. And then we have number 11, the impatient. The impatient. And you find a lot of people in church and the thing is that they are impatient they don't want to wait for their time and they don't want to wait for this is what the lord wants me to have and i'm going to wait for my time it's not only in marriage and sometimes it's in ministry 
that somebody feels I've been in this church this long. I ought to be this by now. I ought to be doing this by now. And if the sin doesn't come to him immediately, he's ignorant. And he's ignorant of the fact that if you run ahead of God, you're going to get late when you run ahead of God. It will give you the disaster of your heart and it will send leanness to your soul. And because they're ignorant, that's why they're impatient. And sometimes you'll find the people too in the various areas of their Christian lives, of various areas of their mysterious life, there's impatience. And it is ignorance again. But it has compassion on the ignorant. And it is that compassion that leads us to intercession. We intercede for them. Number 12. And this one is not the ignorant. It's the illuminated. He has been enlightened in the word of God. He's illuminated. He's a child of God. He's born again. He's converted. And the word of God is showing him light. And still you need to have compassion on him too. And you also need to help him in prayer, intercession, intercession for the ignorant, intercession for the impenitent, intercession for the immoral, intercession for the immodest, intercession for the impure, intercession for the indifferent, intercession for the incorrigible, intercession for the inconsistent, intercession for the infirm, intercession for the incurable, intercession for the impatient, intercession for the illuminated. And we come tonight talking about intercession. The intercession of compassionate leaders. And if you're going to actually see the intercessor, the greatest intercessor and the perfect intercessor is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. In Hebrews chapter 7, Hebrews chapter 7, reading from verse 25, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. He ever liveth to make intercession for them. And then he tells us in the next verse, For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. That's the Lord Jesus Christ, pure and righteous, holy and true faithful and the amen of god and we're told that as he brings his people together he has saved them and he's able to keep them saved and save them to the uttermost and then we're told what he does now he ever leaves to make intercession for them and if we're going to be Christ-like leaders, we also need to be living to make intercession for the people of God, for the church of God, and for the sinners, for the people that have come into the church, but they have not been converted, they have not been born again. Intercession. We're looking at Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Romans chapter 8, verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. That's Christ. And it shows us the perfect pattern in ministry. And it's not just preaching alone. There's preaching, there's praying, there's instruction, there's intercession. And so, the Lord Jesus Christ is now at the right hand of majesty on high. And he maketh intercession for us. In verse 26, in verse 26 it says, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we shall pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now the Spirit of God, the way the Spirit operates, it comes into the heart of the sanctified, set apart, anointed believer, the minister. And then with groanings that cannot be uttered. Uh, sometimes we don't understand ministry. Uh, let's say, for example, if you saw your husband, uh, you know, at home, and your husband was groaning with a kind of groaning that cannot be uttered. And the groaning is so much that you're even afraid that the, the heart of the husband, uh, the heart of your husband, just stop like because this groan is too much. And sometimes what some women will do will be uh, you'll tap him. What's happening? What's happening? You'll quench the spirit. Because you don't understand that kind of groaning. Or maybe if you don't want to tap him, you might go to the next room and bang the door and keep on banging doors in the house. 
so that that noise will distract his attention. And then all that groaning will stop. I don't want him to die. The way he's groaning like that, he can die. You have not read Charles G. Finney. The spirit of God, the spirit of intercession, will just come upon Charles G. Finney in a very serious way. And then he'll be groaning. He'll be groaning. And sometimes he'll be groaning like that for hours. And it's not something that he is not a make-believe. And it's not, some, it's not acting. There are some people that are actors. There are some people that act. And that action you know, grieves the spirit of God. It's hypocritical. And it's not real. And the crying and the screaming is not real. But the groaning that is given by the Lord. You are concerned about the sinners in the congregation. You are concerned about the impenitent incorrigible in the congregation. And the spirit of intercession comes upon you. And you are groaning with such a groaning that you cannot even utter words out. And sometimes uh, Charles Giffany will go into the meeting. They had invited him. And uh, when he invited him like that, and then he came to a particular place, they were singing. And the song was so bad, he put his fingers in his ears. He couldn't bear uh, the, 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 dis the discord in the singing. And then when uh, he got there, after he finished that kind of discordant singing, then he rose up, he began to pray, he began to preach. As he began to preach, uh, and this, uh, you understand, Charles G. Finney was Presbyterian. He wasn't Pentecostal. Only that the Spirit of God came upon him and he had Pentecostal experiences. And he pointed like this. He said, Lord, and then all the relatives of Lord, and this and that. He had never been in that place. And the man that invited him, they called him Lord. But he didn't, he didn't know. And then all of a sudden, the people were looking at him as if they were angry. And as they were looking at him with anger like that, as if they thought that he had been told that the person was called Lord and all the rest of the people that she you know they were like relatives of Lord, that they were like Sodom and Gomorrah. That's why they were angry at him because he was preaching so much directly at them. And then when they got angry like that, the groaning began within his heart. He wasn't angry at them. It was the spirit of intercession. And, as he, and that thing was rising up within him. All those people broke down and they began to weep and cry, praying that God will convert them and God will change their lives. And the man that invited him, Lord, the one they called Lord, he was the only one just staying like this, calm and cool and looking and looking around him, looking at why are these people like this? And then uh, Charles G. Uh, Finney said, why are you staying like that? Get on your knees and begin to pray. When he said the spirit of compassion and intercession fell on that man and they prayed. They prayed and then when Finney tried to stop them, he couldn't. The shouting was too much. The screaming was too much. And the conviction was too much. He went one by one laying hands on them. He wasn't Pentecostal. And yet he did that by the leading of the spirit of God. They were being converted, being converted, being converted. Until the following morning, they couldn't stop praying. The following day when the meeting was, start, was to start again, they had not finished praying. They just kept on praying. That's the kind of thing we're saying. When the spirit of God gets hold of the leader, of the minister, and then that spirit of intercession with compassion comes upon him. In verse 27, it says, And he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to, according to, according to the will of God makes intercession according to the will of god i divide the message to three parts number one frequent intercession by gracious leaders frequent intercession by gracious leaders number two focused intercession by godly leaders intercession that is focused focused intercession by godly leaders number three fervent intercession by grieved leaders at times leaders are grieved by what they see when moses came back from the mountain and he saw that all his labor that the lord called him to aaron had turned everything upside down and the people were worshiping idols and god said moses i'm disappointed about these people i'm going to destroy them lord don't do that but he came and then he saw that they were naked already their dressing had changed the attitude had changed. Frivolity had taken over. Idolatry had taken over. And the dancing of Egypt, of, idol of idolatry had taken over. He was grieved in his heart. So grieved, he threw the tables of stone down and broke them. 
And God never rebuked him for being so grieved to drop those tables on ground and to break them. Never. Because God understood. God himself was grieved. And his mind was grieved. And Moses' heart was the same with that heart of God at that time. And he didn't say, Moses, why did you break those stones? The people are broken the law already. And also there's no point to give it to them. And therefore the tables were broken. That man was grieved. But he went into fervent intercession. Fervent intercession by grieved leaders. Point number one. Frequent intercession by gracious leaders. In Romans chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 1. Romans chapter 10 verse 1. Brethren. My heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And it wasn't a prayer, just prayed once and stopped. As long as they remained in their being incorrigible and being impenitent and unsaved, he kept on praying for them. That's my prayer. For the children of Israel, my king's men after the flesh. My prayer for them is that they might be safe. I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they've been ignorant of God's righteousness. And going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the Mosaic law, of the ceremonial law, of the ritual laws. Of the sacrificial laws christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth they were ignorant of that therefore they were still worshiping in the old testament way but paul the apostle was a gracious leader and the lord wants us to be gracious leaders like that and go into intercession lamentation chapter 2 in lamentation chapter 2 verses 18 and 19 Lamentation chapter 2 verse 18 They had cried unto the Lord O wall of the daughter of Zion Let tears run down like a river Day and night Give thyself no rest Let not the apple of thine eye cease If a minister in a church were to do this today Not pretending Not acting If a minister were to go to the Lord and say Lord Give me my tears back, my lost tears. Give them back to me. To weep over the erring ones. To be so compassionate upon them. To have the heart to rescue the perishing and to save the lost. Give me tears for sinners. All our young people, I hear many of us when we preach, we refer to our children. Like our brother just finished the message now. On the godly families and the glorious church. The concern that when our children go to their institution, that they don't want to even have anything to do with Deeper Life Campus Fellowship. And that they might go to other places, or maybe at the Bible, time of Bible study, is when the children will say, Daddy, I'm sick, I'm having a headache, I cannot go out now. And yet they are trying to go to other places. And then we come to church and if we see those young people there, the way they dress and the way they do things, we think that the thing to do is to, you know, wash them down and dress them down and criticize them and condemn them and crush them and scatter them and send them away. If they don't want to come to church, let them stay at home. We think that's the way to do. If a minister will go back to the Bible today and the minister will say, Lord, enough of critical preaching, condemnatory preaching. Enough of slashing these uh, young people. We ourselves, our eyes are too dry. And our hearts are too dry. Lord, give us compassion. Lord, give us tears that will weep over these erring ones. And then you have this heart crying out unto the Lord. Like the wall of the daughter of Zion. And tears running down like a river day and night. If any minister will do that today, you might be surprised. The blasphemy of some members of the church. They will be, as the minister is coming like this, they want to illustrate to him that he has become a weeping minister, a weeping leader, a weeping prophet. And they want to make fun of him. All of a sudden, as they are meeting the members of the church, members of deeper life, to quench the spirit of intercession and to destroy the, 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 the broken heart, the contrite heart. And the compassion that is serving on the is concerned. And instead of helping him and praying for him in secret, Pastor is grieved. 
the pastor is not happy the standard is breaking down and the holiness he wants to see is not seeing it uh, some of the members will meet him and while they're meeting him like this they'll burst into tears drama and it's blasphemy and then the pastor will realize okay they are telling me i'm making a fool of myself i'm crying too much i'm weeping too much and the compassion i'm having is being misunderstood and let not your good works be misunderstood and so eventually the uh, the pastor or the leader might say since this is becoming the talk of the church the talk of the town i think i better stop this kind of intercession and this kind of brokenness of heart and this kind of contrite heart i think i better stop all this and when he stops and you stop and he stops and you stop then there's no revival and the hardness of heart in those young people will continue but this is the word of the lord for a bible church let tears run down day and night give thyself no rest let not the apple of thy eyes arise cry out in the night in the beginning of the watches pour out thine heart like water before the face of the lord lift up thy hands toward him for the for the life of thy young children that faint for hunger in the top of every street as we look at our children roaming about aimless children and they do not have purpose for living direction in the other directives for to live and then you become concerned you become gracious compassionate and you intercede for them and that's what the lord is calling us to and when you know that the judgment of god is coming i believe that a leader sought to be students of the bible and leaders sought to know that generally civilization passes through a kind of cycle it begins and, it, and it, it's the same thing with religious organizations they always go in a cycle you study the churches you will see that when they start there's conviction and then there's fire and there's seriousness and almost every member in that religious organization they'll be fiery and they will be standing on the same thing and then when they go to the next stage it comes to the stage of the conviction is still there but now there's formality with that conviction they still believe what they believe and they still stand for what they stand for and they still have their tenets of faith but there's formality and eventually the third stage will come where some people begin to question even the things that are foundational and then eventually there will be people that outwardly, openly, aggressively will go against some of the things that the church has held dear in the past. Eventually there will be total backsliding, falling away and apostasy. It's always in a cycle. And when you study church history and you study the Bible and you see that now it's a cycle. And this is the point on the circle where this church is now. And you know that if God does not arrest the situation, the hand of the clock is going to move on until it comes to the point of falling and falling away. Then you become concerned. And then you know that the judgment of God will fall eventually. That's the time the leader will go into intercession. It will change gear. It will change method. It will change strategy. Instead of, you know, lashing the people, correcting the people, and beating them on the head and saying, wake up, stand up. He knows that, you know, they pass in the cycle, when they pass that stage, it is the time for intercession. In Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. Reading from verse 17. In Genesis chapter 18, verse 17. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and a mighty nation. And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, 
I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the cry of each which is coming unto me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces. Those are the angels from thence. And they went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Will thou also destroy the righteous or the wicked? Peradventure there shall be fifty righteous within the city. Will thou also destroy and not spare? the place for the fifty righteous that are therein that be far from thee to do after this manner to slay the righteous or the wicked that the righteous should be as the wicked that that be far from thee shall not the judge of the earth do right and the Lord said if I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city then I will spare all the place for their sakes when you read about the judgment of God and you know that judgment is coming and you know that if there is no change, there is no transformation, there is no turning around, it is inescapable. The judgment will definitely come. It will come on individuals, it will come on families, it will come on a group of people. You go into intercession. And so, we as leaders, all the other qualities we have learned in leadership, that's very important. And the intercession I'm talking about, we're not talking about, you know, the, just having the prayer warriors. That's great. That's good. That's wonderful. We're talking about the leader himself, the pastor himself. We're talking about the, the leaders, the coordinators, the pastors, and the women coordinators on their own. You see your local church, and you see the condition there. Instead of just talking, just talking, just discussing, your husband is coordinator, the wife is coordinator, and you just talk about your district. You pray, and you intercede. And it's like your heart is breaking. And if you want to fast, go ahead. If the Lord is leading you to fast for that church, pray and fast until the hand of the Lord will touch the people there. And then the messages that you are preaching will have effect and influence upon the people. Point number two, focused intercession by godly leaders. Focused intercession by godly leaders. Now, the, the prayer we ought to pray for the church should be focused. And as you see the intercession of others in the Bible, uh, for example, the Lord Jesus Christ, it was very specific in Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32. Luke chapter 22. I'm reading from verse 31. In verse 31, it says, And the Lord said, Simon, 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 behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee. I have prayed for thee. I, the Lord, your pastor, your shepherd, I have prayed for thee that thy faith should not fail. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Specific prayer, focused intercession. It wasn't, a, you know, many of the prayers were pray. In fact, uh, sometimes, um, I think you need to understand. Uh, that's why I told you that as I study you and understand you, you too, you ought to study me and understand me. Sometimes we finish a retreat. And I have gone through all the faith clinics. And I've gone through all the encouragement. And I've prayed for the people. And then after the prayer, the prayer, the prayer. And encouragement then the retreat finishes as the retreat finishes then I see that I say I want to counsel and then the first person that comes in pastor I have a headache you need to pray for me and I say my dear sister or you are the yes pastor I was there I was waiting for this time just to see you did you hear the testimonies last night testimony night all those people barren people getting children people lame walking did you hear that person that came she had been under the power of witchcraft for a long time and god delivered her yes i had pastor but you know uh, i have a day can you are my pastor you'll pray for me then i pray another person comes in i'm sick another one comes in i'm sick another one comes and they don't tell me about their christian lives they are not concerned about heaven. They are not concerned about holiness. They are not concerned about the temptations they are facing, which they are not able to overcome. All they need is pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. And sometimes I said, I said, Lord, is this how a teaching shepherd, a teaching pastor, is this how he will spend his life? Only for headache, for stomach problem, 
for ear problem, for physical problem. I about the holiness. They're not asking for prayer. I about strength in their Christian lives. They're not asking for prayer. I about the challenges they are facing to overcome temptation. They're not asking for counseling. All they're asking for success, prosperity, healing, deliverance. Is this how we're going to continue? And sometimes when we finish retreat like this, I, I make up the arrangement. You know, immediately I finish like I just hand over and then I run off. I go back home. And some people say, where is pastor? Where is pastor? And you know, pastor doesn't love us. Why, how will he not love you? Who else will he love? Of course he loves you. But he's teaching you that you need to change. Come for counseling. And ask for things that are serious. And when you come for counseling, you don't come and make a caricature of counseling and be saying some things that, you know, you should know I have the spirit of God. And sometimes when I, when I answer you, I just answer so that, you know, I keep my cool and I know, that, I, I know some people that come and they come like this, they come like that, but I know what you are coming for. I just answer you just to dismiss and say, okay, go your way, my dear. God bless you. You are still ignorant. I'll be praying for you in secret. But you know counseling that will really help that we don't turn the church to pray for me pray for me church that real real counseling here the lord jesus said simon simon satan has desire to have you satan is jealous is not happy that i am having you he wants to take you away from me and he wants to sift you like wheat but I prayed for you. You see, that's intercession from Jesus. Did Jesus, did God answer the prayer? Yes, God answered the prayer. But you say that uh, Peter denied Christ. Yes, he did. How then do you say that, Jesus, that God answered the prayer? Listen, what the devil intended was that he will sweep, it will, he will uh, kind of seed the wheat. And then all that will remain will be chaff, and then it will be thrown into the fire, it will be burnt, and that Peter will be lost eternally and forever. That was the purpose of the devil. And that was what Jesus was praying against. He wants to have you, and have you not only for one week, not only for one moment, have you permanently, and take you away from me totally, and sift you like wheat, and then throw the wheat into his stomach, and then throw the shaft into the fire, that nothing will be left of you. But Peter, that's not going to happen. I prayed for you. But you're backslide because you're too self-confident, but you'll be converted. When you are converted, strengthen your brethren. Focused intercession. That you know the specific needs of the, the spiritual lives of these people, and you focus that intercession on those specific spiritual needs. In Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, reading from verse 9. Philippians chapter 1, reading from verse 9. Here we are told, and this I pray. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. As we pray for the people of God, what kind of prayer do we pray? What's the content of our prayer? And what is the focus of our intercession? Here is the intercession of Paul the Apostle, the leader, over this Philippians church. It says, I'm praying for you. That your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all wisdom. That she may approve things that are excellent. This is prayer. And that ye may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. Christian life. Christian living. Christian stability, holiness and righteousness, purity of heart and purity of life. In verse 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness. That's the prayer I was praying for them. Which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and the praise of God. Colossians chapter 1, focused intercession. In Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 9. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that she might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. This is intercession. And this is a focused kind of intercession. It's not just, you know, praying, heal them, no sickness in our church. Well, thank God if there's no sickness. 
and bless their businesses thank god if god is blessing their businesses is that the greatest prayer we can pray for the people of god focus intercession by godly leaders that he prayed and he said that he desired that they will be filled with the knowledge of the will of god that all these uh, heat and run heat and miss looking for the will of god never getting the will of god ever learning never able to come to the knowledge of the truth that the lord will deal with that in the church at Colossae. that's what he prayed for that he will be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that ye might walk worthy of the lord unto all pleasing that's intercession and you will see the focus of that intercession it is on the spiritual life have you noticed that whenever we pray if a message is given if it's on holiness walking worthy pleasing the lord and then we we'll finish that prayer we we'll say let when we'll the preaching will say let us pray the, the prayer will be so cold but if we preach on overcoming witchcraft and overcoming demons and casting them out and being free all those things walking about in your body today is the day of deliverance and dominion we're going to walk over them hear the people pray they thunder when they pray it will look as if the whole building is going to come down because they are praying on convenience and healing for the body but when it comes to praying on something spiritual that she might walk worthy of the lord unto all pleasing being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of god strengthened with all might according to the glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness giving thanks unto the father which has made us me to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light when it comes to praying like that on these important things reach riches of the kingdom of god the prayer for many people will be so cold and if we pray if we say we're interceding for our congregations what kind of prayers are we praying are we praying with our heart with our mind with everything within us because of the spiritual lives of the people that's the kind of intercession we're talking about in ephesians chapter one ephesians chapter one reading from verse 15 ephesians chapter one verse 15 here we are told in the word of god wherefore i also after i heard of your faith in the lord jesus and love unto all sins cease not to give thanks for you making mention of you in my prayers paul what are you praying for for the church in ephesus that god the god of our lord jesus christ the father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him that's prayer the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that she may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance and says and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us what who believe according to the working of his mighty power you see that's the prayer we ought to be praying chapter 3 ephesians chapter 3 reading from verse 14 for this cause i bow my knees unto the father of our lord jesus christ of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by the spirit in the inner man focused intercession by godly leaders that as we pray for the church and we're interceding for the church and we're interceding for various sections of the church that these are the strengths of the prayer that the lord will strengthen the people in the inner man by his spirit in verse 17 that christ may dwell in your heart by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breast and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of christ that's prayer the focus of the prayer of the apostle of the leader over the church at ephesus over the church or for the church of of the philip of philippi or the church at Colossae, the spiritual getting them ready for heaven and then it says to know the love of christ which passeth all knowledge that she might be filled with all the fullness of god he prayed for the church he said that she might be filled with the fullness of the lord himself and as we pray for the church and that should be our concern and we pray passionately and we pray fervently praying that the lord himself will prepare them for the coming of the lord in in first thessalonians chapter 3 first thessalonians chapter 3 
verse 10 night and day pray exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith we also pray for ourselves that god will uh, speed up our journey to come to you and that when we come to you we want god to use us to perfect your faith then he says now god himself and our father and our lord jesus christ direct your our way unto you and the lord make you he has started the prayer now the lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men even as we do toward you to the end for the purpose that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before god even our father at the coming of our lord jesus christ with all his saints he wanted them to be holy he wanted them to be unblameable he wanted them to be unblameable in holiness and he prayed for that and that should really be the strength of our prayer uh, did you notice when um, we dealt with the character study and our minister was talking on epaphras do you, did you realize the content of his prayer to uh, look at it again in in colossians chapter 4 colossians chapter 4 reading from verse 12 epaphras who is one of you a servant of christ saluteth you always laboring fervently for you in prayers intercession a godly leader looking at the spiritual condition of the church and is concerned for the spiritual condition of that church and it's not only laboring in preaching it's laboring in prayers and it's not only fervent in spirit while declaring the word of god it's fervent in spirit while praying interceding for the people and what was the what was the purpose of the prayer the request in the prayer the content of the prayer his desire in that prayer that she may stand perfect and complete in all the will of god that's why i was praying that's why i was praying he prayed that the people will be so perfect and complete in the totality of the revelation of the will of god and isn't that what ought to be in our hearts as we're praying for the people of god don't you see shortcomings don't you see inadequacies don't you see childishness don't you see carnality don't you even see worldliness and don't you even see backsliding and don't you see things that shouldn't be in a saved sanctified church bible church have you seen perfection in all its fullness have you seen completeness in the doing of the will of god in the section where you walk in your local church where you are no you have not what then should be the major thing that you are going to be asking the lord in intercession here it is like a paraphrase a paraphrase who is one of you a colossian like yourself a member of the church like yourself but now has become a servant of the lord a fellow liberal a servant of christ he salutes you it was now at this time where Paul the Apostle and, he, and as this letter is going with him and is to deliver the letter, he said he's saluting you, he's greeting you too. Always I bear him record, always laboring fervently, fervently. Paul, how did you know? Oh, sometimes when we travel together and then we're not preaching and he's staying in his room and then I want to see him a paraphrase where I want to see him for something. I open the door and as I look inside like this, the aura, the anointing, and the greatness of the of the fervency in prayer i cannot i cannot touch that man i cannot call him again i quickly i just shut the door quietly because i know that he's lost in the spirit of prayer fervently praying for you and sometimes before i close the door i hear him it's not quiet praying that the paraphrase was praying it's prayer that was rending his heart breaking his heart tearing his heart apart and then i hear him mentioning the people at Colossae, the people at Colossae, that they will be perfect that they will be complete in all the will of god in verse 13 for i bear him record that he has a great zeal for you and them that are in laodicea and them in hierapolis he'll finish with the people in Colossae, then he'll jump on laodicea lord the people 
people of Laodicea, they're so rich now, and there's lukewarmness there, they're getting cold. If you come and meet them in this condition, are you not going to spill them out? Oh Lord, have mercy upon them. Come unto them, stand at the door. Lord, knock at their door again. Come into them again. He has zeal for you and the people in Laodicea. And then for those people in Hierapolis, I'm telling you that when I hear him pray, he really intercedes for you. And that's what he thought to be. When we're leaders in the church and we're concerned, you see all these discussions you are having among maybe the leadership, uh, look at the church now and see the way the church is. It's not like 1970 such. It's not like even 1982. I remember the kind of meeting we had at that other time, Jesus 78, how the people really were blessed and the people prayed and prayed. Instead of all that discussion, prayer, intercession, and it is what will make the ministry actually to come up and enrich the lives of the people. Point number three, fervent intercession by grieved leaders. There are times leaders are grieved. Give them the liberty to be grieved when they need to be grieved. And give them the liberty to express their grief when they need to. Uh, look at your Bible. And which leaders have not been grieved when they see unrighteousness, iniquity, sin, idolatry, backsliding, pride, incorrigibility. Is it Moses? Wasn't he grieved? Is it Joshua? When he came back from the field, from the battlefield, and he defeated the people of God, and he didn't know there was an Achan in the midst of the people, and then he threw dust and ashes upon his head, and then he fell on the ground and said, Oh God, what am I going to do? That's grief. Who wasn't grieved? Look at David as the angels destroying people, dying here and dying there. And then he said, Oh Lord, the sheep, what have they done? Am I not the one that's saying to count the people? Are you going to kill all the people, all the sheep in the fold? Kill me. I'm the one in charge. I'm the one that was guilty. Isn't that grief? Or when you come to Daniel, Daniel chapter 9, as Daniel came up and he said, Oh Lord, we have sinned. Our fathers have sinned. We have not obeyed your commandments. Oh Lord, forgive us. Myself and my father's house, we have done evil before you. Lord, have mercy. Remember your covenant. He was grieved. I about Nehemiah. I wasn't Nehemiah grieved when he came and he saw the walls of Jerusalem. And they are all falling. And he said, We have become a reproach to all the heathen around. Oh Lord, are you going to forsake us like this? Or are we going to talk about the Lord Jesus? Jesus Christ wasn't he grieved when he looked at Jerusalem and he wept over Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jerusalem if you had known the time of your peace but it's escaped from you and he wept over there, wasn't he grieved? Of course he was grieved. I about Peter, I about Paul the apostle I'm hearing you Corinthians have labored so much in Corinth and you're not behind in any of the spiritual gifts I'm hearing there's fornication among you even such fornication as has not been named among the Gentiles that one of you should take his father's wife now even though I'm absent and present with you in the spirit, deal with that man, get him out of the church. Wasn't that man grieved? Of course he was grieved. And then John the beloved on the Isle of Patmos. He had labored very much in the church of Ephesus. And then the Lord said, uh, John begin to write everything I tell you unto the church of Ephesus and Smyrna and Pagamos and Tatyra and Sardis and Philadelphia and Laodicea. Write to them. And you tell the church of Ephesus, I know your works, I know your patience, I know your service, I know your labor. But I have something one thing against you you have left your first love and as john the beloved on the all apartments he had been suffering for that church and now he's isolated there in persecution don't you think he was grieved yes there are times that leaders are grieved and when the grief comes we pray we intercede our hearts are broken when we see the edifice, when we see the temple collapsing and coming down, that's what you have labored for. Because of that, you intercede. We don't gossip, we don't fight, and we don't criticize, we don't do anything like that. We shouldn't. If we've been doing that, we we'll stop that. And we go on our knees and we intercede for the people of God. Exodus chapter 32. In Exodus chapter 32, reading from verse 7. Exodus chapter 32 verse 7 and the Lord said unto Moses go get thee down for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves Moses knew there was a problem because now God didn't say they are my people he said go go back go to your people that you brought out of Egypt they have corrupted themselves they have turned aside quickly 
out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed thereunto and said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up of the land out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people. Behold, it's a stiff necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make thee a great nation. And Moses besought the Lord his God, and said, Lord, why does thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Do you see the, what Moses was saying? God was saying, Moses, you brought them out. And Moses replied, Ah, God, how can you say that God? He was a friend of God. He spoke to God face to face. He was a beloved of the Lord God. You can't say that. You are the one by your mighty power. You brought them out and by mighty hand. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of their turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham. And remember I can remember Israel thy servants to whom thou swearest by thine own self and said unto them I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed and ye shall inherit it forever and the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people that is that's intercession but, but I want you to read the whole thing because you see there are times that you may get into a false attitude in leadership if you read only a part and sometimes uh, you know you, you you refer to this story and you say you, you see Moses Moses didn't bother to discipline the people because he wasn't a disciplinarian or he, he was a leader with love with compassion all he did he prayed for the people and he told God pardon them forgive them leave them alone and spare them and God spared them and this is the love of a leader the compassion of a leader the caring of a leader and so those who preach like that those who have that understanding of half truth which is half lie would say therefore we leaders should be very careful don't discipline the people leave them alone all we're to do for them this is not the you know time to discipline love compassion care kindness forgiveness prayer intercession finished no it's not finished look at verse 15 and Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tables of test of the testimony which were in his hand and the tables were reaching on both sides on the one side and on the other side they were reaching and the tables were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that sing do I hear. And it came to pass, as soon as he came near unto the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot, and he, and he cast the stones, the tables, out of his hand. And he break beneath, and, and break be, them beneath the mountain, the mount. And he took the calf, which they had made, and he burnt it in the fire. And he ground it to powder, and he strode it upon the water, and made the children of Israel to drink it. Nothing is, you cannot digest nothing because it's a metal, it's gold. He ground it to powder, and he put it in water. He said, you people, see what you have done. I've gone for only less than six weeks, 40 days, and you have all backsliding, and you are dancing around, around this. Give me this thing. He burnt it in a fire, ground it to powder, and they put it in water. Everybody, line up. And then he made them drink. That's discipline. Yes, a compassionate leader, a loving leader. But not a jellyfish leader either. Not a compromising leader either. That we are compassionate doesn't mean that we overlook sin. 
that were interceding. O Lord, don't destroy them. O Lord, spare them. O Lord, count them as your people. You brought them out of the land of Egypt. Remember Abraham, remember Isaac, remember Israel that were interceding. Doesn't mean that we're going to pass by sin without seeing anything at all. And they were told in, um, in uh, verse 21, And Moses said unto Aaron, what did these people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. My Lord, Moses was the junior brother of Aaron. But uh, I think uh, Moses was a real leader, a real leader. That even though he was the junior brother to Aaron, he wasn't so familiar with Aaron that Aaron will say, Boy, have you forgotten? Shut up. I'm your senior brother. Moses, in his leadership, retained the dignity of leadership. That even the family relationship did not spoil the very fact that God raised him up and one of the workers working under him happened to be his own senior brother. And so Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. For they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us. For as for days, Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we what not, we know not what has become of him. And I said unto them, Whosoever has any gold, let them break it up. So they gave it me, and I cast it into the fire. And there came out this calf. Aaron, you are not telling the whole truth. You threw it in the fire. You didn't do anything at all. You didn't do any kind of construction, engraving, or molding. The thing just came out. And Moses saw. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together. Just one tribe. The rest on the other side. And he said unto them, Thus says the Lord of his, God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, And go in and out from, the gate, from gate to gate, Throughout the camp, And slay every man his brother, And every man his companion, And every man his neighbor. That's discipline. You know, there are some of these uh, preachers that don't read the whole Bible. They don't even read the whole chapter. And they will omit all these things we're reading. They read the other part of intercession. They omit the discipline. And it tells in their own, in their own locations, in their churches too. That the people, they do just anything. Their pastor is, you know, jellyfish, a, a leader that doesn't have any backbone, cannot discipline anybody. And, you know, it's all love. You know, we thank God for our leader, for our pastor. And you know, he, he never rebukes anybody. He smiles. He, he knows what we are going through. And even when you do something very, very bad and you report to him and say, you know, uh, Pastor, I'm sorry I committed. Uh, I'm sorry I'm committed. What did you commit? I committed adultery. Eh, there you are. Go and pray. Don't tell other people, but go and pray. God is compassionate. God will forgive you. Be careful, though. Should I leave the work? Hmm. If we drive everybody away from the walk, who will remain? Anyway, go and pray. I'll be doing your work. Don't do that again. I like our leader. That's the one that is going to destroy the church. I like your leader. But we are told in the case of Moses, he told them that you are to bring discipline upon the people. And then we are told, it says in verse 28, and the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses. And there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourself this today to the Lord, even every man upon his son and upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. That it is when you consecrate yourself like that and you fight against sin and you discipline sin, that's when you discipline the sinners, the backsliders, that's when the, 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 the love of God and the blessing of God will flow again. But you know, that didn't console the compassion and the intercession. It comes back now. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have seen the great sin. 
now i will go in i will go up unto the lord proud venture i shall make an atonement for your sin and moses returned unto the lord and said oh these people have seen the great sin and have made them gods of gold yet now if thou will forgive their sin well and if not blot me i pray you out of the book which thou hast written that's compassion that's intercession and eventually the lord answered his prayer although he told him and the lord said unto moses whosoever has sinned against me him will i blot out of my book and you know that he also had to pray for even aaron deuteronomy chapter deuteronomy chapter 9 deuteronomy chapter 9 and we're looking at here from verse 12 yes there's discipline but there's compassion too there's discipline then there's intercession too you intercede but intercession will not console the fact that you have to deal with sin if sin appears deuteronomy chapter chapter 9 verse 12 and the lord said unto me arise get thee down quickly from hence for thy people which thou hast brought forth of egypt have corrupted themselves and they are quickly turned aside out of the way which i commanded which i commanded them they have made them a molten image Furthermore, the Lord spake unto me, saying, I have seen this people, and behold, it's a stiff-necked people. Let me alone, that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven, and I will make thee of thee a mightier nation, and, it, and greater than they. So I turned and came down from the mount, and the mount burnt with fire, and the two tables of the covenant were in my two hands. And I looked, and behold, ye had sinned against the Lord your God, and had made you a multitude calf and ye had turned aside quickly out of the way which the lord had commanded you and i took the two tables and i cast them out of my two hands and break them before your eyes i fell down before the lord as at first forty days and forty nights i did neither eat bread nor drink water because of all your sins which ye sinned in doing wickedly in the sight of the lord to provoke him to anger for i was afraid of the anger and the hot displeasure wherewith the lord was wroth against you to destroy you but the lord hearkened unto me at that time also and the lord was very angry with aaron to have destroyed him the lord was very angry with aaron to have destroyed him and i prayed for aaron also the same time and so that's the intercession and what the lord is calling us to today is such intercession that will realize that as a gracious leader you have frequent intercession for the people as a godly leader you have focused intercession for the people and when the people are not living right and they have seen and you see carelessness in this section in that section in that section if you need to discipline you discipline but with love with compassion and still interceding for them and you take yourself to the lord your grief will drive you to the lord and then fervently you will call upon the lord for the people that's what we are going to do tonight we're going to intercede for the church i said we're going to intercede for the church and intercession will not stop here tonight when you get back home husband and wife when you get back home coordinator when you get back home pastor when you get back home um, uh, overseers you'll intercede for your people make it frequent make it focused and make it fervent and the lord will have mercy upon his people in jesus name let's rise up and talk to the lord in prayer you're not praying for yourself now you're interceding intercession the intercession of compassionate leaders intercession of compassionate leaders rise up open your mouth this is real praying time real intercession time we're going to pray before the lord for the people of god for the sheep in the flock in the fold of the lord